Hello again, Dr. Ben White's here, and I'm so excited to be able to speak to you today. And I'm so happy that you decided to spend a little bit of your listening or viewing time with me to learn about another uh, important topic in the world of functional medicine. In this case, um, what to do about heavy metals, how to test for them, how to get them out of our body with Dr. Chris Shade of Quicksilver Scientific. And today is going to be a broadcast of a functional medicine meeting that we did online with functional medicine practitioners, and they were able to ask questions um, uh, online. And so I, I asked Dr. Shade their questions as well as my questions, but it's very similar to our regular podcast. I just wanted to point out to um, those of you listening today that uh, educating people and this podcast is a passion of mine. But the way I earn my living is by um, consulting with patients, both in person and uh, virtually, um, about functional medicine, functional nutrition, um, any sort of health issues that they want to address with a root cause approach. And I also see patients in my chiropractic office in Santa Monica for chiropractic care. Anybody interested, you can call my office at 310-395-3111. And for those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, it would be helpful if you went to Apple Podcasts and give us a ratings and review. And I also wanted to remind everybody who's perhaps listening on their phone through Apple Podcasts or Spotify or all the other um, areas it's on, um, that there's also a video version if you go to my YouTube page, White's Cairo. And if you go to my website, drwhites.com, you can find detailed show notes and a complete transcript. So um, let's get into the podcast with Dr. Chris Shade about heavy metal detoxification. I want to thank very much Quicksilver Scientific for sponsoring um, tonight's event. And for all of you listening in tonight, you will get 15% off your next order of Quicksilver Scientific products if you use the uh, discount code WHITES, my last name, W-E-I-T-Z, 15 for products ordered from now until September 4th. If you are a practitioner, if you are a practitioner and, you, and you do not have a professional account with Quicksilver, you can email Katherine Sumner at Catherine, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E dot S-U-M-N-E-R at quicksilverscientific.com. And she can set, set you up with an account so you can receive the discount. If you're not aware, Quicksilver is Dr. Shade's company that makes some of the most amazing products for detoxification that are widely used in the functional medicine world. Our topic for tonight is heavy metal detoxification with Dr. Chris Shade. We will cover how best to test for heavy metals, what are some of the most effective and safest ways to detoxify metals from our body. We all, we all know that we live in a very toxic world and many of, our, of us are exposed to various heavy metals in our everyday lives, including mercury, lead, arsenic, nickel, aluminum, and cadmium, uh, which are pretty much always toxic. And then there are other metals that in small quantities are essential nutrients, but are toxic if at higher levels, like chromium, copper, zinc, and selenium. Now, there's a lot of controversy over how to test for these heavy metals, and even more controversy over how to reduce metals in our bodies. And so we're going to try to clear up some of those controversies tonight. So for example, does it require doing intravenous chelation to get rid of metals? Or can I just place my feet in an ionic foot bath? Or can I just brush my teeth with charcoal toothpaste? Um, there are many products marketed to detox heavy metals, some of which have no proven effectiveness. So we really need to hone in on what products have been scientifically proven to be effective and what particular protocols are going to work for us and our patients. Dr. Chris Shade is one of the most brilliant PhD researchers working in the field of nutritional supplements and 
Dr. Chris Shade is the um, founder and CEO of Quicksilver Scientific. Quicksilver Scientific is known especially for its heavy metal testing and detoxification products and its unique liposomal supplement delivery systems, among other things. So Dr. Shade, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Ben, I'm happy to be here. Love to talk about this stuff. It's second nature now. Oh, I, I know you've been talking about heavy metal detox and other forms of detox for a very long time. But for those of us who are not familiar with your story, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background in farming and how you became interested in heavy metals. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's really a story about how you get interested, not just in here's why detox metals. A lot of people's story is like, I was just shattered by metals, and then all I thought about was getting out from under metals. And, and when you do that, you get a little like, uh, you know, if it's mercury, you get a little mercurocentric. Uh, but really, it was an education in becoming a holistic thinker and how does nature deal with things? How do people deal with things? How do fish, how do birds deal with things? And so I was in uh, environmental chemistry as an undergraduate and I remember learning these stories, you know, environmental chemistry, you just tend to test where the polluters are and uh, and then, you know, you pollute some groundwater, you try to pump it out, you never really get it out. And it's just this kind of futility thing of running after industrial pollution and pretending you're cleaning it up. But then there's a deeper understanding called biogeochemistry, which is about how elements cycle in the earth, how they go into the atmosphere, down into the water, how they move through the food chain, what happens in the sediments, how they go into phytoplankton, zooplankton, fish, and move on through. And that's really where you understand the dynamics of element cycling and the, the dynamics that we were studying were those of mercury. And at the time, uh, all the money had gone out of studying mercury and people. This was sort of post the, the first scare around uh, vaccines and mercury. And so all the money moved from the NIH and CDC and moved over to the EPA. And all the studying was on mercury moving through the food chain and how it infected biota. And so we had very complex models of transitions of mercury forms in the atmosphere, in the rain, in the water, uh, how they partition into different things that bind them in the cells. And key to that is that things like mercury are never present like sodium is in the water as a free ion. They're always bound to something. So it depends what kind of ions are present there, what molecules are present to bind it. And so it was very sophisticated and you know, you, you know how much is bound on cysteine, how much is bound on glutathione in a cell, in the blood. And when I came in over into, well, I had developed this testing because to really test biomagnification, we had to separate different forms of mercury. That being methylmercury from fish and inorganic mercury, the sort of primal form of mercury. And, uh, and when I came over into looking at clinical, I realized nobody was respecting the different forms. Nobody was respecting how the, the metal is complex, how it moves. And nobody was respecting the fact that the body has an innate system for detoxification, the glutathione system and also the methionine system. And I brought across these ideas and I said, look, you don't need to just use chelators to do this. You can upregulate your natural system. First, we should test better and separate the different forms of mercury and look at how they excrete. And then we should upregulate aspects of our biochemistry because they're not only the ones that depurate it, meaning take it out of the system, get it out into excretion patterns, urine, fecal, sweat. They're also the ones at the same time that are making the cells resistant to whatever residual mercury is there. So let's change the language from this one of what's your body burden and how does a chelator get it out to what is your resistance to metals versus your susceptibility versus how much is in there. And we can 
work on these different things. We can turn up your resistance and at the same time, turn up your depression, how much comes out. And in doing that, we found that we got people better faster. There was less of this, the chelator made me worse, a much more of this, oh my God, I started feeling better right away and then kept getting better, 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 better. At the same time, my blood levels went down because we're working to make the cell more resistant and get the stuff at the set, out at the same time. And that doesn't mean that there's not a place where the two can play together. But the underlying thing is you must upregulate the glutathione system, the underlying detoxification system. And then if you want to speed up depuration by putting some chelator in to get you to pee it out faster, you can do that, but only once you've corrected the system. And so I developed the testing. I moved in to starting Quicksilver Scientific first doing environmental testing and then moving on to uh, doing clinical testing and then moving on to developing the tools to detoxify. And uh, so that was really my story of how I did that. And along the way, halfway through my PhD, I had 17 freaking amalgams in my mouth. I had come from Bethlehem, this home place of Bethlehem Steel, the second biggest steel plant in the world. I was stinking full of metals and I saw it, I felt it. And then when I went to get the stuff out, I used chelators and they got me sicker. That was really how I knew I was going the wrong way. And then when I went to fixing the system, I fixed myself and developed everything that we do now, Quicksilver Scientific. Cool. So let's start with testing. Um, what's the best way to test for heavy metals? And so the, the, the first part of that question I want to ask is, if and I know you know the answer to this, and this is, gets asked a lot, but if metals are stored in our bones and organs, wouldn't it make the most sense to take an oral chelator like DMSA to liberate those metals and then measure our urine before and after? If we're just measuring the levels in the blood, then we're not really going to get the levels in the tissues. Well, if that was true, it would be the best way, but it's not true. It's not, it's not that they're not stored more in the tissues. There's a dynamic equilibrium between what's in the tissues and what's in the blood. And there's more in the tissues than is in the blood. But the lie is the idea that the chelators go and liberate this stuff from the tissues. They don't, they don't get into cellular. All they do is go into the blood a little plasma and get a little bit of the kidney burden, liver, well, they make that more kidney filtrable and then you pee it out. So you're still working from the blood. So why not just measure the blood? <laughs> then the whole like, and you know, this has been all proved out, but the whole mythology around the chelation challenge was that these things go into the blood and they give you a representative, uh, they go into the cells and give you a representative example of everything, but they don't do that. So you're working with what's in the blood. You're going to strip that off into the urine. And hopefully you're going to have a reference range in urine that's from chelated uh, urine. But it's not. The reference range is from non-chelated urine. So no matter who you are, when you take a chelator, your urine levels go up. So it becomes this excuse to chelate everybody, not to look at where everybody really is with their metals levels. So urine after chelation if the kidneys are working is a measure of what was in the blood and what's in the blood is a measure of what was in the tissues in fact when you go and you like turn up nrf2 that's a trigger in the body to dump things into the blood when you turn that up the blood levels will actually rise for a little bit and then come down it's showing you what you need to pump things out of the blood uh, out of the cells into the blood now but, can you uh, can i stop you for a second is, I've heard you talk a lot about NRF2 as being a key um, pathway. Why is NF NRF2 so important? So NRF2 is a trigger in, outside of the nucleus in the cell that is a stress response switch. It's looking at chemical and oxidative stressors in the cell. And if those oxidative stressors go up, mm -hmm or electrophilic stressors, that means something that pulls electrons out and oxidizes things like metals do. Then this NRF2 goes into the nucleus and it turns up the expression of the genes for all of the chemoprotective system. That's the genes for all of the glutathione synthesis, glutathione transferase, the transporters, all the defense mechanisms against uh, those toxins. And so that's what you need to 
elevate in order to throw things out of the cell into the blood. And then once you're out of the cell into the blood, you need to turn up the, the filters. That's the liver, the kidneys, the GI, the skin even, that take it out of the blood into excretion. Um, so is it sufficient to just send out to Quest or LabCorp for heavy metal serum testing because this is, say, covered by the patient's insurance and less costly? Good question. Quest and LabCorp are looking at whole blood mercury and whole blood mercury not speciated, not separated into inorganic and methyl mercury is really a measure of methyl mercury. So if I took you, Ben, and I injected equal amounts, say you had no mercury, and we inject equal amounts of methyl from fish and inorganic mercury from amalgam, we'd fill up your blood and then that would fill into the tissues. And then after a couple of days, it would come to this equilibrium and we'd see a small amount of inorganic mercury and a large amount of methyl mercury, maybe 10, 15 times more methyl mercury. It doesn't mean it's because you had more, it's because of this equilibrium uh, between the tissues and the blood. So it's more to the tissues for inorganic, less to the tissues for methyl mercury. So then that means when you go and do blood mercury, whole mercury, it's really a measure of how much methyl mercury you have, which is a measure of how much fish you eat. And inorganic mercury, if all your mercury was from dental amalgam, then uh, you would, and you had no fish mercury, you'd have a very, very small amount in the blood. And in fact, the 95th percentile for inorganic mercury is below the detection limits for Quest and LabCorp. So if you don't eat any fish, you have a ton of amalgams and you send in a blood sample, you're not going to see anything. And you go, well, I don't have any mercury. So then a good occupational toxicologist would say, oh, inorganic mercury, that's in the urine. You have to run your urine. And your urine may be high if your kidneys are working, but if they're not working, then your urine will be low. And that's a, that's a transport system in the proximal tubules that brings mercury from the blood into the urine. And if it's not working, you'll show low urine. So you can have high blood, low urine. That's called retention toxicity. Okay, so what's the best way to test for mercury? Well, you got to send it to me. Uh, I know that. The mercury tri test. <laughs> so the blood, we will show you methyl and inorganic mercury independently with independent reference ranges. And then we'll show the urine. And then we'll take your blood inorganic mercury and compare it to the urine on a graph, which will show you as your blood goes up, your urine should go up. Are you on that equilibrium line or are you off? If you're not on the equilibrium line and you're below it, that means you're retaining it. The kidneys aren't excreting it and it's building up in your blood. Hair to blood ratio, hair is all methylmercury. Blood has both. You compare hair mercury to blood methylmercury, it's more of a liver proxy for how you mobilize methylmercury. So there you're getting excretion patterns and the relative ratio. Now, now why, why, is, why is hair um, uh, a measure of how you, uh, how you liver mobilizes mercury? Yeah, I know. That, so the urine to blood is really, really direct. The hair to blood, that was based, we did that based on some tests, uh, some studies that were done uh, by Boyd Haley looking at metals. And these are metals that are mostly detoxified by the liver. You know, it was, uh, they were looking at copper, uh, mercury, and I think cadmium. And uh, they saw that in autistic kids, they knew relatively how much mercury should be in their body based on, they were, they were, they were pretty young based on what their mother's exposure was. And they saw that the more the sphere of the autism, the lower the mercury levels in the hair. So they saw a dysfunction in the transport system going into the hair. So that's where we picked that up. The reason we relate it to liver is liver is where all the methylmercury goes out. It doesn't go out through the kidneys. You don't get any methylmercury in the urine. You only get inorganic mercury in the urine. And then through the bile, you get methylmercury and inorganic mercury. What about using hair analysis for other metals as a general screen? Because it's easy to do. Uh, you know, there's this whole like sort of cult movement around that. And uh, yeah, maybe I diminished it by saying cult movement. But <laughs> all, the, all the data, you know, if you, you look to like, 
uh, Natural Resource Council, you know, these big scientific groups, the relationship between uh, mercury in the hair and fish consumption is just like well studied, really well studied. A lot of the others are just all over the map. And so they're like, oh, it's high, you're excreting it. Oh, it's low, you're not excreting it. And it's just like the basic research on whether that's relevant to the body is not really there. And they like to call it hair tissue mineral analysis. And it's as if it's the same as taking like a biopsy, but that's not really true. And it's never been, uh, it's never really been, never been proven out. Now it doesn't mean that there isn't a relationship to it. And these guys haven't built out systems that show things. It's just not a direct way to do these. Uh, since we're talking about the metals, I, I just want to make a suggestion. You might, you might consider including additional metals besides the ones you include. So, for example, today I had a patient who had uh, symptoms of metal toxicity, and we're thinking it might have to do with this metal-on-metal metal hip plant implant he has, yeah. which is cobalt and um, chromium. Uh, yeah, we actually have cobalt and chromium in our blood metals analysis. So oh, those are in there. Oh, okay. uh, but you know, really we've got to change the reference ranges a lot. When the cobalt chromium comes up, it comes up really, really high. And then sometimes it's localized. It's a little bit difficult uh, to track, but they're both on the, so we have the mercury tri test and then we have the blood metals uh, panel and the blood metals panel in the nutrients has chromium, but you just look for when it goes off the nutrient scale into too much. Kind of no. like manganese. You know, there's are you do you have the right amount of manganese or you have this ridiculously high amount of manganese? Right. Or copper. Copper, you know, high copper is a real problem and it makes synergistic toxicities with all the rest of the metals. Right. So um what but there it? are some we do need to add, but they're hard to do in blood. So we're developing a urine panel too. And that would be nickel, uranium, and uh, one that's a, a rat poison, and the one that's a radio tracer. There's beryllium. Are you going to add that one? Beryllium, not really. Beryllium... You know, it's not really toxic unless you get tons. And then you got ones that are toxic when they're radioactive, but you can't really tell the difference between the radioactive and the non-radioactive ones. I see. Like cesium, people want that. Right. Uh, right. Okay, so um, what symptoms should alert us to the fact that somebody might have heavy metal toxicity? Well, uh, the the... Fatigue and anxiety are the most quintessential, uh, the most quintessential symptoms. So fatigue, because all the metals are working at a mitochondrial level to diminish uh, the antioxidant pool in the mitochondria. They're like sucking down all the glutathione and thyroid oxygen in the, in the mitochondria, and they're creating free radical damage, which, which damages, damages the membranes. Then the mitochondria can't make ATP. They also work at a thyroid level. And so you'll be looking, if you're looking at thyroid labs, you look at the TH4, TH3 ratios. And what they do is they damage the ability of uh, the deiodinase to take T4 to T3. So you'll have normal or high T4, but low T3, that's usually uh, a metal thing. And it's mercury, uh, cadmium, and arsenic dominantly, and also to a second degree, the others. And then it works at an adrenal level. I mean, uh, you know, the metals really accumulate in the kidneys, all aspects of the kidneys, and they burn those out. Plus the adrenals are trying to keep up with things all the time. Another thing that metals do, which is not, it's sort of an unsung problem, is a disordered inflammatory response. So when you have an inflammatory response, you have a little infection, you have a secretion of both inflammatory and pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. You're trying to create a fire somewhere and a wall around it. So you're not burning everything up. And metals are shown at physiological levels, like the higher physiological levels, to block the secretion of the counter-inflammatory cytokines. So you just have a pro-inflammatory storm. So, I mean, that's what's going on right now. The people get sick, have pro-inflammatory and not counter-inflammatory. And so the metals do that uh, as well. And so they're sucking down 
uh, then your adrenals are burned out trying to put out glucocorticosteroids all the time, trying to counter this inflammatory storm that's coming out of the immune cells on a cytokine level. So it's, that's the way that they burn out your adrenals. So you're burning out all your energy supply. Then most of them, and the most notable of which is mercury, are glutamate receptor agonists. And so they wind up the hyperfunctioning of the glutamate receptors, which of course gets you anxiety, uh, and eventually will drive you into a deeper uh, neuroinflammatory state called neuroinflammation. And that's where you engage also the uh, immune side of the brain as well as the glutamate receptors. And when those really start going, you don't just get anxiety. Then you get these deeper brain fog and these cycles of, influ of, uh, of depression and anxiety. And your whole autonomics switch into a dysautonomia in which they are hypersympathetic, all right? And sympathetic autonomic nervous system tone shuts down detoxification through prioritization pathways. Prioritization meaning how are we going to use ATP? Now, if we're parasympathetic, our ATP is going to be driven towards rest, digest, repair, regenerate, detoxify, all the rebuilding stuff. But if you're in sympathetic, it's just fight or flight. So you're going to deprioritize all the regenerative medicine. So, and what really engages with the mercury to drive you into deep neuroinflammation is endotoxin, which you're getting from leaky gut, chronic jaw infections, chronic UTIs, gingivitis, and, and periodontitis all drive endotoxin. Yeah, I mean, SIBO for sure, but then we think it's all in the gut, but your freaking mouth generates a ton of endotoxin too. Absolutely. So um, what's the best way to detox? Can I just do a juice fast or can I just uh, do a water only fast? Can't my body detoxify itself? You're laying up these softballs for me, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice if only it were. Uh, <laughs> You know, if everything else was good and we were living in the mountains and we were all chill and, and we were eating, you know, wild food and like getting all the phytonutrients, yeah, we wouldn't really have a problem. But we're not. <laughs> we're chronically sympathetically activated, meaning we're chronically down-regulating detoxification. We're chronically eating inflammatory foods. We're eating, you know, not enough like real intense phytonutrient foods. And so what we need to do is take all the stuff that activates all all these nuclear transcription factors like, a, like uh, NRF2 activates uh, cardiometabolic factors like AMPK uh, to liberate to, and taking things like glutathione, which are the necessary cofactors, and that'll liberate the metals from the cells, put them into the blood, the liver will dump them into the bile, into the GI, the kidneys will dump them into the urinary flow, and you'll get them out. And then you just have to assist the product, the process by putting binders into the GI tract that take the things that come out through the bile and make sure that they don't get re- uh, Well, hang on, hang on one second. I, I was trying to mute people and somehow, here, let me do this. Let me mute everybody. And then where are you? There we go. Okay. So just to throw out this framework for detox, You've got a cellular level, call, I call the microcosmic level, and that's the, the conjugation of the metals onto glutathione and the transport out of the okay, cell. Okay, so let, me, let me stop you there. What do yeah. we mean by conjugation of metals onto glutathione? All right, well, let me give the framework. Okay. We want to push from the cells into the blood. We want to pull from the blood into the liver, dump from the liver into the bile, get it to the GI, and stick it on a binder. Now, how do we get it out of the cell? And that's back to the conjugation thing. So if there is a metal in the cell, remember the metals are never just free ions. They're always bound to something. And so you have to take it off of uh, a protein it's bound to, a membrane it's bound to, and you want to link it onto glutathione. So you need this intermediary. It's called a phase two transferase. It's called glutathione S transferase. And it's going to kind of grab the edge of the metal and the edge of the glutathione, bring them close together, whisper sweet nothings in their ear, and boom, they're a pair. All right? They let go of the previous one and they go with the new one. All right? Now, now where does this glutathione S transferase come from? 
Uh, well, it's synthesized. You've got genes to turn that on. You've always got a little bit around. And then when you have NRF2 upregulation, you'll synthesize more of it. So then it'll float around in the cell and it's sensing when there's a metal in a bad place and it'll, it'll get the glutathione and it'll like pull those two together and boom, then you have the conjugation reaction and you have a metal glutathione conjugate in the cell. So that's floating around in the cell but it doesn't passively diffuse across the cell membranes. You have to get it out of the cell into the extracellular space and then into the blood. And that's the transporters. So that's phase three. So phase three is transmembrane transporters that use ATP and magnesium to push these things out of the cell. So, so hang on one second. So you're referring to, we have phase one, phase two, and phase three of liver detoxification, right? Yeah. Well, of all detoxification, of all we detoxification. call that liver detoxification. But what if you're, you know, if you're a thyroid cell and you have a toxin in there and you need phase one, two, and three, what are you going to do? Wait for the liver to walk into your thyroid? But do you have a cytochrome P450 system in the thyroid? Yep. Oh, okay. You got all that everywhere. You got multiple copies of it in the liver because the liver has to handle so much. So maybe you got 10x more in the liver than you do in the thyroid, but the thyroid has to be able to do this. Okay. So now we got to clear up the difference between glutathione. Well, I never talked about phase one with, uh, with the metals because metals don't need phase one. All right. So, Really, like if you're a PCB or a flame retardant, like a polybrominated diphenyl ether, you need a phase one to create you from, take you from being a non-reactive thing to being a reactive thing. And phase one chops into that molecule and makes it more reactive so that phase two, you can link a glutathione onto it. And then phase three can move it out. But metals don't need that because they're already reactive. So we talk about, well, you need the glutathione, then you need the transferase phase two, and then you need the transport phase three. So metals pick up at phase two, but most other molecules start at phase one, but not all. You know, they all come into the pathways at different places, like a polyphenol. It, like, we don't, like, we don't often think about, well, how am I gonna detoxify resveratrol? But you have to detoxify resveratrol, and you start also at phase two. So it's more rapid than, thing, than things that need phase one, two, and three. Okay, so, um, so we, we, we uh, attach glutathione to the metals, and then we have the transporters to, to get it out of the organ, and then what's the next step? So then they're in the blood, and when they're in the blood, then they gotta get out, right? And so you have another transporter at the liver at the basolateral side of the liver. This is the blood side of the liver. So now you got to think about, we'll make a little rectangular liver cell, a hepatocyte. You've got the basolateral side that harvests toxins from the blood. And then on the other side, you got the canalicular side. That's the side that's on the bioflow, on the biocanaliculus. Biocanaliculus is like the bile tree is like an upside down root ball going down to a tree trunk. And the little rootlets, the little tiny hairs of roots are called the canaliculi, and they come together into bigger ducts. So the bile canaliculus, you're secreting bile salts out of your hepatocyte into the bile. Same transport system that moves the bile salts moves the toxins. So you're moving toxins and bile together, and there's two transporters that are sisters that live together in that membrane. They upregulate, downregulate together. So right there, you're like, wait, what if I'm cholestatic? Well, then you're toxostatic. You have to move bile and toxins together. They got to go together or they don't go. And so you're setting up this flow from the blood to the hepatocyte to the bile. And the blood, you have transporters, phase three transporters, it's called the organic anion transport peptide, OATP, and it'll pull that mercury glutathione conjugate into the hepatocyte. It'll go over to the canalicular membrane and it'll dump through MRP2 into the bioflow and go into the GI tract. Now that's all well and good. It's a methylmercury, the kind from fish, the glutathione will fall apart and you'll be left with methylmercury bind to cysteine, the amino acid with the sulfur on it from the glutathione. 
And that's actually the same form that you absorb from the fish. So you reabsorb it in the gut. So when that gets down to the gut, you want to stick it onto a binder so it doesn't come back in. There's a lot of toxins that have this reabsorption phenomena, especially biotoxins like mold toxins. But then in the metals, it's methylmercury and cadmium are the primary ones. So we want to kick out from the cell, go to the blood, pull into the liver, dump into the bile, get to the GI and get a binder. So there's all these ways that we can fuck up. The cell might not be doing it. The liver might not be pulling in. The liver might not be dumping out or you might be reabsorbing. So all that I call the directionality, the baton race needs to be hand off one to one to one to one to get all the way down there, stuck onto a binder, and then you poop it out. So what, what are some of the problems that the sticking points in the liver that can keep us from um, being able to handle this? Inflammation. So, uh, all right, there's a couple main ones. I want to hit inflammation and the prime inflammogen, something that generates inflammation, being endotoxin. Same thing we just talked about a second ago. What, stops what about the cellular N level? Stops the, stops the liver level. What about N NAFLD, which is getting to be really common? Yes, we'll wind that in in just one second. Okay. So, uh, Inflammation in the liver, and the inflammation can be from endotoxin, or the inflammation can be secondary to fatty buildup in the liver, and we'll talk about AMPK and how that winds into this whole thing. Uh, but then uh, stress, just being sympathetically dominant, locks up that bioflow. That's why when you're parasympathetic, you get hungry. Why? Because your, uh, your liver opens up and you secrete bile down into the GI, and you secrete uh, other, other digestive enzymes. But what are the things that block all that? So I want to set up a connection between the glutamate receptors and sympathetic dominance and the, the bioflow. So the other thing that can block the flow of the toxins out of the liver is estrogen dominance. So est high estrogen, whether you're just estrogen dominant or whether it's during pregnancy and it's temporary, are going to block that bioflow. Now, what does estrogen do in the brain? It makes you glutamate receptor hyperactive, which gives you glutamate dominance, which gives you what? Irritability and anxiety, which is what estrogen dominance gives you. And what does that do on an autonomic level? It puts you into a sympathetic autonomic tone, which is further deprioritizing detoxification. So that whole stress axis just locks you up. So we want to calm things down. Now, on a hormone level, what, what unlocks all that? Progesterone, because progesterone is a GABA receptor agonist, or at least the metabolites are. And progesterone, if you taste it, is hyper bitter, and bitters all open up the liver. So that's why we use a lot of bitters in opening up the liver. So all that is, you know, open, closed. So fatty liver, then, whenever we our... That's more of an AMPK switch. So AMPK is what's activated when you're carb restricted, when you're fasting, when you're on a keto diet, when you exercise really heavily, all that draws down ATP temporarily and activates the AMPK kinase, which activates burning of fuel. So what fuel do you burn? You burn your stored glycogen, you burn your stored fat. So if you're always carb loading, you are always building up fatty deposits. Fatty deposits are the generators of chronic inflammatory cytokines like NF-kappa-beta. And they build up in the liver and they generate NF-kappa-beta and TNF-alpha highly in the liver, which eventually result in activating these hepatic stillite cells, which end up being myofibroblasts, which then start making fibrotic liver. All that is activating all these inflammatory processes which are blocking detoxification. So fatty liver brings with it toxicosis or toxostasis. Then going the opposite way opens it all up. Now it turns out a lot of the things that I thought I was using as NRF2 upregulators are also very strong AMPK activators. So all your polyphenols like we use quercetin and luteolin uh, berberine and resveratrol also do that. EGCG does that. They're all very good for that. Turns out lipoic acid is too. Now, lipoic acid is probably our best NRF2 upregulator and also an AMPK activator. And so we'll use that. Like if we're going more after clearing out liver, 
we're going to use a different blend of things than if we're going for cardiometabolic strength. We have a product called AMPK Charge, used to be called Keto Before Six. Puts you right into ketosis. In like an hour, you're making blood ketones, like nutritional ketosis from drinking, eating fries and drinking beer the night before. Because it's such a strong AMPK activator. Now, if we just want the AMPK, we go more with the polyphenols. If we want more NRF2, then we'll put in the lipoic acid as well so that we can get the cellular response to detox. And, and AMPK also brings with it a big amount of cytoskeletal organization around the liver. I mean, people talk about leaky gut all the time. Who talks about leaky liver? There is leaky liver. Of there's course. Leaky liver, there's leaky blood brain barrier. And as Grace Lou likes to talk about, there's also leaky vagina. So there's <laughs> leaky everything. And that's all the integrity of the adherence in the tight junction. And what brings them up? MPK activation. And so in fatty liver and, and, and fibrotic liver, you have leaky liver. And so AMPK restores that cytoskeletal organization, and it's also restoring the canalicular membrane and the transport of the bile and the toxins out of the hepatocyte. And so it just brings all of that together, and including bringing up cell membrane polarization. So what's the best way to get the bile stimulated? So we, you know, we use this stuff called liver sauce and liver sauce, as the name implies, <laughs> is something that is like A1 for your liver. It does everything. So we use bitter compounds, you know, classical bitters like gentian and uh, dandelion, yeah, saltadago, you know, and then we use myrrh. We have all that in there. And then we have- Now, now let me both. stop you for a second. So those bitters have been a sort of naturopathic- um, Go to go to for you know long period of time, but have they really been shown scientifically to uh, significantly affect bioflow? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, A4M made me put a bunch of slides in, in my presentation, and yeah, they're called the GOGs. They upregulate bioflow. Every one of them has been studied independently. Okay. The last 10, 15 years are ridiculous for how much primary research has come out of the universities looking at all these. Uh, all these specific compounds and herbal extracts. They mostly like pure compounds, but they'll do her herbal extracts and stuff. All that shit works. And, it, you know, it, it, sometimes we know every part in the chain. Sometimes we just know that it brings it up. So we got bitters and then PC is part of the MDR, which is a transporter that keeps the bile flowing that uses all phosphatidylcholine. So we got all that in there. And uh, then we got milk thistle and lipoic acid, lipoic acid for NRF2 and AMPK. Milk thistle anchors the, this is part of why it's a powder protective, is it anchors those transport proteins in the canalicular membrane. So when the, at, when the oxidative or chemical stress comes up, they don't give up on their job because you'll see often they just turn all that transport off. And then what do they do? When there's too much free radical damage and toxin damage in the cell because you can't get it out through the bile, it dumps all that stuff out of the cell back into the blood. It's the backwash of the liver back into the blood when the liver can't process because say it's under too much autonomic sympathetic stress, hormone stress, inflammatory stress, it dumps it all back into the blood. That's all the negative effects people get from detoxification when they're like, oh, I'm herxing, you know, you're not herxing. Herxing is a specific immunological reaction. What you're doing is dumping all these toxins from your liver back into your blood. They're going to your kidneys. You have that lower back pain. They're going to your skin. You got rashes and itching and they're going to your brain and you feel like crap. All that's because that anchoring through the liver into the bile isn't happening. So milk thistle helps anchor that as well as bring up phase one and phase two. So it's helping with all the different phases. And then we have an immunologic program in there that's an AMPK activator and a mast cell stabilizer, and that's Kristen and luteolin and DIM. Now, DIM, why do people use DIM? People use DIM for estrogen metabolites, but they miss the whole bigger picture of DIM. It's an NRF2 up regulator, good. It brings up all this detoxification stuff. More importantly, it's an NRF2 epigenetic modifier. When epigenetics block either NRF2 or some of the mechanisms, some of the, well, just say when, when epigenetic processes block NRF2, DIM can release them. And we see that mostly from mold. 
Mold isn't always epigenetic. This is what's called post-translational blockage. But DIM reverses all that. So mold blocks your liver function. And DIM can reverse that. DIM also reverses a lot of the immunological reactivity to foods. And so the TH cells, you know, you've got TH1 polarization, then TH2, TH17. TH2 and TH17 are this runaway allergic inflammation. And then there's T regulatory dominance, which is immunopassivity. So DIM pulls you into T regulatory dominance and takes you away from TH2, TH17, which are sort of autoimmune runaway reactions. So DIM is bringing down inflammation because inflammation blocks detox. It's unleashing NRF2 from post-translational and epigenetic effects. So you're saying- And it's an AMP activator and an NRF2 activator. So, so you want ingredients that hit a lot of targets all at once. So DIM is something we could use if we have a patient who has a lot of food sensitivities? Yeah, that's, you know, I started using it because I was getting into hormones and I made a nano dim and I just started taking it like I do with everything. And I'm like, oh my God, my food reactivities are going away. And then like all these different changes, I took it for like three months and it was like every week was like a new week. It was like, oh, the sun is shining. Wow. And then I gave it to other people and a lot of, you know, a lot of their food reactivities have gone away. So it's one of these unknown. Clinical pearl, clinical pearl. <laughs> What's that? That's a great clinical pearl right there. Wow, it's a huge one. <laughs> so obviously gut health is super important because, you know, what's going to happen to the bile if you're constipated and your gut's not working right? Yeah, so when the bile's not flowing, that'll get you constipated. And when you're constipated, it'll stop the bile from flowing. So those, those both are feeding against each other. SIBO, so SIBO, you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because your bile's not flowing enough and bile's a detergent and an antimicrobial in the upper GI. The upper GI isn't supposed to have all the probiotics. That's the lower GI. Upper GI is pretty sterile. It's a chemical reactor. And so when that stuff crawls up there, it's because the bile's not pushing it down. So whenever you're trying to do a SIBO protocol, you should be encouraging bile flow. It's interesting because uh, Dr. Rabar, who I think is listening to this call tonight, uh, he's an integrative gastroenterologist, and he was telling me how he gets SIBO patients, and a lot of times they'll have bile that flows backwards, and he'll see it in the, um, yeah, he'll see it in the in the upper uh, intestine. He'll see it in the stomach. Flows backward. You mean like they throw it up? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, well, that's a problem with the sphincter there at the, you know, going into the GI and it's coming back up there. Uh, so that's a directionality problem and that needs to be corrected. And I don't know necessarily how that's, uh, how that's done. Right. Okay. So um, what is, um, I've heard you talk about using CBD as an important factor in this uh, process. Yeah. So Inflammation and detoxification are fundamental opposites. Inflammation blocks detoxification at a cellular level, at a liver level. It's just doing it all over the place. And at a brain level. Uh, so the inflammation is making you sympathetic dominant. So CBD blocks inflammation at a brain level first and then cascading down. And so it's taking you from sympathetic dominance to a parasympathetic sympathetic balance. It's cleaving the cycles of neuroinflammation by stabilizing glutamate receptors and stabilizing activated microglia. So I first saw this use in autism. The autistic kids, God, you'd have to like, for the first two years, you just talk to them about detoxification. For the next three years, you show them the bottle. And the next two, 10 years, you start one year, every year you give them a, a drop more than you used to give them. Like it was a painfully slow process. And then you give them some CBD and you're like, okay, here's the adult dose. I mean, it just created this beautiful window for detox. You do the CBD, you push in the liver sauce, you give them the binder and you're like, whoa, you're detoxifying like a pro. Now, is there a role for using uh, chelators in this process? Yeah, so first restore the whole damn thing and make sure the cells are working, the liver is working, everything else. And then if you want to poke in a little bit of DMPS or DMSA, uh, like DMPS better, or, or EDTA for sure, and then just do small doses and that'll take more out of the blood and put it through the kidneys into the urine. Now, first you want to do that testing, make sure that's all right. And then you can speed up the process. I remember Huggins used to use like 
five to 25 milligrams of DMSA a day, along with using our metal binder and some glutathione. And, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, over at Ultra Wellness, Mark Hyman's group, Todd Lapine does this. He blends it too. I'm going to do Chris's glutathione system up regulation. I'm going to do damn PS. Uh, but you don't do the chelators without the other. Always, when in doubt, you're always going to do glutathione system up regulation. If they're pretty stable and impatient, then you can put in uh, some chelator too. Now, which are the best binders, and does it depend on each metal? Is there an ideal binder for each metal? Well, we made IMD, which is a, it's like putting DMPS on a little silica grain, and that one's super good for all metals. Uh, and, and what is that made out of? So these are sulfhydro groups like you find on DMPS or glutathione, and they're covalently bound onto a tiny silica gel particle with tons of surface area. So it's like a little particle with a million hairs that all have sulfhydrals. And any metal that gets near it just get trapped into these hairs and get taken out the, the GI tract. So those are most specific for mercury, cadmium, arsenic, but they'll stu still do lead and nickel. It's interesting, oral EDTA is a binder for lead because EDTA is not absorbed through the GI tract. And, uh, and so, but I, I think you could just use IMD for, for, all, for all of the metals there. Now we add in zeolite and, uh, and charcoals because zeolite and charcoals are gonna work on, uh, on your mold toxins and a lot of the, um, you, you know, all of the other environmental things, the pesticides, herbicides, the volatile organic chemicals. So we actually use a cocktail. We use charcoal, zeolite, Kaidazan, which is a molecular mimic for well call that's used in the Richie Schumacher protocols for, right. uh, for, for mold. And then we use IMD, and then we put in some GI candy. It's uh, uh, acacia gum and aloe. And this is all included in your Ultra Binder product? Yeah, yeah, the Ultra Binder. And then so, you know, we do this combo pair push catch liver detox. You do the liver sauce, and then the Ultra Binder half hour later. So push the toxins catch them. And then you got all the add-ons. I got neuroinflammation. I add on CBD. I got metals. I'm going to add on glutathione. I got lead. I'm going to add on liposomal EDTA. You take them all with, with uh, all the liposomes at once and then go to the binder. And um, so um, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the binders, um, when's the best time to take them? You said a half an hour after, after you uh, take the um, liver sauce or the glutathione? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, a half hour is a nice, uh, simple timing. Uh, it can be anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes up to an hour. You know, 45 might even be better, but half hour you feel it. Like you take this stuff and then a half hour later, like if you're toxic, you're like, hmm, there's something happening. You take the binder and you're like, oh, perfect. And binder then, anytime you get into a detox and you feel funny, more binder almost always blocks the reaction. Now, of course, binders will block all these nutrients from having any role either, potentially, right? Yeah, if you take your nutrients and your binders at the same time, but that's pretty stupid. So right. why would you do that? <laughs> so it is, remember your GI is a tube, one thing in, then the next thing, then the next thing, and they all go. It's funny, they don't actually mix. They actually go in a... In a uh, you know, so, they don't exactly yeah. go that quick. So but, you yeah. take your binder and you wait right. a half hour, 45 minutes until you eat. And then the binder's through, and then you can eat. You take your supplements and stuff. If you right. want to be really careful, then you wait you know, to like lunch for your supplements. If you're doing something like you're like a serious medication, you know, say you're doing your thyroid or heart medication, give it an hour, two hours afterward, just to make sure that the binder wasn't, you didn't have delayed gastric emptying because it will bind that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. So, um, who wants to ask questions? We've got a few questions. I think we've, I've, I've been trying to blend them in. Um, somebody asked about you at the beginning, you were mentioning about resistance and susceptibility. I guess, you know, some yeah. people can get exposed to toxins and not have any effect and other people are super sensitive. Yeah. And, uh, and that is how upregulated your cellular detoxification systems are and your systemic ones. So, and it's really more how good is the cell? Because I've seen 
like this, if the cell's pushing away really at a fast rate, the blood levels will actually be higher, but the cellular levels are lower. And so it comes down to that coding for those. And, uh, and when that is up, you're keeping your cellular machinery free of the metals. And so you, when you keep inflammation down and you keep NRF2 and AMPK up, you have higher resistance. So um, in terms of um, uh, when you get a complex patient, and this seems to be something that I see um, fairly commonly. You, you have a complex patient and maybe you do a bunch of testing and you find out maybe they have some mycotoxins and they have some metals and maybe they have a, a few gut issues. Um, where do we put metals in importance or do we try to, like let's say you had a patient who had mycotoxins and metals. Would you prioritize one and try to remove it or would you try to do both of them at the same time? I do those both at the same time. The only really question, uh, like, I mean, you might modify some of the things that you're giving them, but you really want to get all the toxins at the same time. And you can't pretend like you're going to kick one out, not the other. Uh, now, maybe glutathione transferase is more important for metals and make me glucuronosyl transferase is good, more important for molds. And, you know, you can either do them both at the same time or you can go back and forth, but there's no separating the two. You can't activate one without activating the other. You can favor one. So that's not really a big question. The big question is the infection versus the toxin. Okay. So infections block detoxification. And so it used to, there were some schools that said, well, you, all right, infections block detox, but toxins diminish your immune system. So a lot of people said, just get the toxins out, your immune system will pop back up. It's not been my experience and with a lot of other people have been like, no, nah, you got to clear an infection first. And, but it doesn't mean you do just one or just the other. We're such a binary brain. We think we do one or the other. It's just relative importance. You're going to be holding up detoxification, but at a lower level, because as you kill things, more toxins come out. And so you've got that going on. Maybe you got that running at 30% out of 100, and you're going to run uh, antimicrobials you know, at 70 to 100%. And, and then as you get a little further into it and you're wiping out the infections more, you're going to switch and you're always going to have both going on so you don't get a resurgence of the infection. So I start uh, antimicrobial dominant and switch to detox dominant. Uh, and when, when you know there's creatures in there, you got to clear out. I've heard some, some practitioners say, look, you got you to gotta fix the gut first because you know, they've got a bunch of gut problems and leaky gut and you were talking about endotoxins you know, that's just going to make the process more difficult. Yeah, but, you know, sometimes the gut problems are from the toxins. And so the toxins are locking the gut problems in place. So you, like, you can never just do one damn thing. I mean, that's just freaking psycho. You've got to, you've got to be blending things. And so, yeah, you're working. But when you use an ultra binder, you're working on gut. So to me, you know, you'd be doing push catch, maybe not hitting it so hard, but you've got gut problems. So you're going to put a lot of other gut things in there. You know, you'll be using the programs just for the gut. You'll be fasting them more. You'll be keeping them away from uh, bad foods, but you can't just ignore detoxification. So one of the questions came in, if you're using your liver push catch protocol, um, does drinking coffee affect it? It helps it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least in my espresso centric lifestyle. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, coffee actually has MPK activating activity, it has the niacin in it. It's, you know, it's got a lot of different things and people are all like, oh, caffeine, it's a toxin. If you do too much coffee, you're gonna make yourself sympathetically, if you're wired, you're gonna be sympathetically dominant and you're not gonna, you're not gonna do that. But a little bit of coffee, you know, what was the, what was the Arrested Development song? Coffee makes you go to the bathroom. <laughs> I don't have a cafe, but my cousin does. It was in a song, you know. Everybody knows it makes you go to the bathroom, which means it's a bioflow stimulant. I mean, you know, you can do an enema of it, and everybody knows that works, but just a little bit of coffee does that too. So the right amount of coffee, good. Too much coffee, you lock up the system. Right. Um, somebody asks, if you have a really high viral burden and metal toxicity at the same time, I think we just covered that. 
Well, no, yeah, yeah, but what do you want to use for that? And so there's a lot of different things, but I want to do that always at the same time. Low glutathione makes high viral burden. And so you've got to bring glutathione into the system and the metals are draining out the glutathione. So a cat's claw was the thing that I used the best for high viral burden and uh, cat's claw along with push catch and glutathione uh, was how I dealt with high viral burden. But sometimes oh, how, how does cat's the virus, claw, there might be other ones that are better. How does cat's claw work? That's an immune stimulant? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's poorly, it's poorly researched, but clinically, you know, clinically people show it. Uh, but it's not, it's an immune stimulant and it's immune modulator. So, the immune system doesn't get so hijacked by the viruses. Things like Epstein-Barr and cytomegalovirus, I've seen the best results with. And they have things that block your ability to take the virus and digest it through autophagy and then mountain immune response to it. So the best I can see, it's blocking the blocking of the digestion of the virus to mount the immune attack. But that one's worked real well for us in the past. It's interesting how some of these pathways, like the AM, AMPK pathway and NRF2, are some of the same pathways that are really uh, beneficial for anti-aging as well. Oh, yeah, totally. Because, you know, <laughs> there's anything we know, longer-lived people have higher glutathione. And I did a glutathione study for uh, LifeWave patches. We were trying to – way back before I was even making glutathione. And so we were measuring uh, – serum glutathione in people uh, or whole blood glutathione in people and uh, seeing if this product raised the glutathione. But the thing that was so obvious is these people who came in and looked super good for their age all had the highest glutathione. The people who looked very dry and free of burned out for their age had the lowest glutathione. And so glutathione, why is that? Because it controls telomerase activity for one, it controls it there's goes into the nucleus and controls cell division, uh, controls the immune system, it controls detox. It does all these different things. So glutathione is a major antioxidant thing, and so NRF2 activation is part of that. It just turns up all the antioxidant system. The only down with it is in cancer that system gets hijacked for uh, you know immortalization of the cell. So everything that's good for anti aging people worry about for cancer. So serum glutathione, is that a good measure of glutathione levels? Whole blood. Whole blood glutathione. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, it is. If, the, if the lab can measure it, right? It's very tricky. It's very labile. It breaks down a lot. I see. So um, it, it's interesting. I wonder if, if anybody's looked at whether whole blood glutathione levels are a marker for outcome with SARS-CoV-2. Oh, well, there's all these anecdotal responses uh, of giving people glutathione and blocking the runaway inflammation of, of SARS. All the, all the anecdotes we got from people using, as soon as they went on liposomal glutathione, they was like, oh, it's, it went from being really bad to being, oh, this isn't so bad. And, uh, and so that's a definite one. And that, that was after they um, had breathing problems or at what stage? They were already breathing? sick, yeah. I mean, I didn't, you know, these were going through some of the doctors that worked for us, so I wasn't direct on all of them. Okay. But they had that whole, you know, hyperfluishness and, and yeah, there was breathing problems. So they weren't in ICU, but uh, they, were, they were having problems. And then over in New York, there were some cases where people were hyper sick and they, they took glutathione and, and uh, started getting better right away. Somebody asked, can you measure um, pyroglutamate, um, which is a glutathione metabolite instead of whole blood glutathione? Yeah, I can't really speak to that, whether that's a good measure. Right. Okay, so I, I think um, people are still coming, but I, th I think those are the questions I have. Any, any final thoughts you want to leave us with, Chris? No, any we've said a lot there. About? I think the importance of the, of the autonomic system is the thing that's missed the most often, and how do you get yourself to an autonomic balance, meaning you've got good parasympathetic balance. It's not just things like CBD. GABA also works for that, but it's – getting into breathing, getting into mindfulness, taking more time for your time for yourself. Yoga, Tai Chi is my favorite. 
all of those lifestyle factors are going to be a big X factor for getting you into proper detoxification. Do you, do you recommend sauna and things like that to stimulate detox? Sauna well? is excellent. Uh, that'll take out some of the excess burden while you're moving a lot of toxins around. The sauna will relieve some out to the skin, make that a little bit easier. Foot baths are actually not taking toxins through the skin. They're an autonomic measure. And I've had people do foot baths and measured their blood metals before and after the foot bath 30 minute thing. Their blood metals go up. That means the tissues dump into the blood, but the next day they're back down. So saunas are relieving, I mean, uh, the, the foot baths are relieving the autonomic lock. Saunas are working on autonomics if they're nice, calm saunas, and they're also relieving toxic burden through the sweat. What about any of these electrical modalities like PEMF? Those all definitely work on autonomic levels. I haven't measured them. I've felt them. Uh, I know they do work. So those are all like you have to set the biochemistry in place, and then what are your, you know, your uh, – your different technical modalities and what are your lifestyle modalities? These are all things that add into it. Uh, um, you recommend infrared sauna for sauna? Infrared is, yeah. is the best, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you for spending you. this time with us. It was fascinating. We all learned a lot. Great clinical pearls. Just want to remind everybody that everybody who listened in on this call get a 15% discount on your next order if they order before September 4th, I think, and use the code uh, WHITES, uh, W-E-I-T-Z, my last name, 15. Um, so thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next month. Great. Thank okay, you so much, Ben. Okay. Take care.